One of the things that um, I've been very closely uh, aligned with and, and connected to, one of my previous books actually, uh, my second book was called Firing in All Cylinders, and uh, came out in the late 80s, early 90s, as we were in the midst of the Achieve Group of working with quite a number of different firms across North America, around the world, around service and quality improvement. So it was around the time of the TQM, continuous quality improvement kind of work. And we built a framework uh, around a lot of that process and a lot of that implementation. And I want to just quickly highlight what many of you are probably familiar with because that quality revolution, which has kind of morphed into different phases with re-engineering and a few years later and then with uh, Six Sigma and various other phases that it's gone through, you see the principles continuing to get deeper and deeper and deeper into our thinking and into our psyche, uh, especially in production kinds of organizations and more recently in service kinds of organizations as well. And I think it's useful to kind of revisit the change in thinking that went on in North America, or that has gone on, especially in the last 20 years ago, because if we were together here 20 years ago, which was about the last time I was in Fort McMurray when I lived in Edmonton for a few years, uh, I actually was uh, working at that time with Culligan Water Conditioning. I was a Hay Culligan man, and uh, we opened a, an, an office here in Fort McMurray back in about 80 or 81. And so around about that time, you recall, we're in the midst of a major recession, and the, uh, our manufacturing sector, particularly our automotive and electronics manufacturing center, was getting beat up very badly, especially by the Japanese. And they were, ironically, using principles that had started in America, and then we started to substitute, or started in North America, we started to substitute here in North America throughout the go-go years of the 50s, 60s, 70s. We began to substitute quantity for quality. We began to develop a mindset that basically said, well, if that car or if that product rolling down the line isn't quite up to snuff, we'll just inspect it, get rid of it, build another one. Got lots more where that came from. And that kind of thinking permeated deep into our management thinking. And so the Japanese came along using techniques that had originated from people like W. Edwards Deming, the statistician, uh, Joseph Duran, the engineer, who went over to the w Japan after the Second World War and helped rebuild the economy where they really had nothing and had to really start from scratch and didn't have the luxury of quantity, had to really figure out how can we build this right the first time. So you know some of this story. And you know, for example, that one of the big shifts in thinking was moving away from this notion of acceptable quality level, saying, well, there's some level of defect that's kind of the acceptable level of defect. So it might be 99% or 98 uh, or 2% or 1% or half a percent, or, but there's some level of defect that's OK. And changing that to the notion of zero defects. And that's where some of you may have read Phil Crosby's book, Quality is Free. All of that thinking was around, well, if we get to the level of zero defects, we're going to have a lot of different benefits that come from that. Some of you may have heard the, the famous story as well around that time of the electronics manufacturer in North America who was subcontracting some components to some Japanese firms. And they told him that the acceptable quality level was whatever it was, a 1% defect rate, we'll say. And uh, they, they received the first ship, and then there was this odd little box with it, with a special little note. And so they opened it up, and in it it said, we don't understand your strange American ways, but here's the 1% defective parts that you asked for. <laughs> and of course, they ripped open and they thoroughly inspected all the rest of the shipment, and it was absolutely perfect. But there were the 1% defects. And that was one of the, the big shifts in thinking that began. You may remember Dem Deming came out with a video in 1981 that was called If Japan Can, Why Can't We? And it really kicked off the revolution, especially in the automotive sector, to sh change our thinking, to begin to realize that we are in expecting quality problems. We are saying it's OK to have quality problems. And of course, the same thing applies. You can see the parallels now when we start talking about safety. Blaming and exhorting was another, and for, of course, Deming was especially uh, angry and, and would get really passionate about how often we blame the workforce and blame workers. 
Some of you may know of his famous rad bead experiment where uh, you would have rad beads and a bunch of other beads and a little paddle, wooden paddle with the indents in it, and you were supposed to pick up no rad, no rad beads at all. Well, of course, you went through and they charted carefully and you, the deviations went up and down. And, and in the end, it became clear that this was a, a fixed game. There was no possible way that you couldn't have some rad beads. And of course, the point that he was making was that it's in the system, it's in the process, and that we've got to look deeper into that. Focusing on individual behavior. Now, yes, individual behavior is important, but oftentimes what's difficult to see is how within individual behavior, even those seven cases that you referred to, Jim, it would be interesting to even go deeper in there and say, well, how much of that was truly because someone didn't stay right in the moment, and maybe a fair bit of it was, and how much of it was more within the system, the culture, the process, the environment that influenced whether people were in the moment or not. Now, of course, it's a bit of chicken and egg, and you can get into a fair bit of debate on this one, but what's emerged is the 85-15 rule, which says that 85% of the time, the problem oftentimes, the defect, the quality issue, the, the safety incident, is often in the process, the system, or the structure. And in a smaller percentage of cases, is it truly the individual just messed up? Now, we can debate whether 85-15 is the right ratio or not, but it's a fairly high ratio. And it really comes back to our obligations as leaders and managers to look at the environments that we create, to look at the conditions that we create, and how that impacts individual behavior. Because individual behavior is often a symptom carrier of deeper issues. On the van in from the airport yesterday, A.B. and I just had a very short conversation, and I, I know later he'll be getting deeper into the changes in thinking within aviation and how it was all about macho individualism and focus on the individual and began to shift. And I'm not going to say much more about that because we didn't talk much more about that. I can't say much more. And, uh, but I, I certainly I'm looking forward to hearing about some of those major shifts that have taken place in thinking and then subsequently in safety and in effectiveness as a result. Inspection versus improvement. Huge change in thinking. Inspecting in quality versus building quality into the process. I've had the privilege of doing some work in, in Kitchener with the Cambridge Toyota plant, which is right there in my backyard. And uh, this plant is the first one outside of Japan that's building a Lexus starting uh, in the new year. And uh, they have the highest quality levels of any plant in North America, uh, of any manufacturing plant, any automotive manufacturing plant. And one of the things that strikes me continuously is I've facilitated some strategic planning with their executive team and gotten to know their organization a little bit is the tremendous effort they put into tracing things upstream, into catching problems or issues far before they've made their way all the way through the chain of events and ends up in a quality problem or a safety problem or whatever it may be. And the, the way they use data and analysis and go way back through to their suppliers and, and all the way back through their, their design processes to make sure that the whole thing is engineered for success all the way through the process. And so their focus is much more on improvement rather than, well, let's just kind of catch the problem just before it hits the assembly line or just before we ship that product out the door. And management support versus management leading, which is, of course, managers basically saying, yeah, go ahead, fill out some of those voice cards, or go ahead, go to some safety training, versus active leadership, which obviously a number of you, certainly the award winners from last evening, I can only guess, have been actively involved in leading the process and looking at your own way of managing and saying, what is it that we're doing? What are the kinds of examples that we're setting? What are the processes that we're controlling that uh, we need to shift and change? So that was some of the, the change that's gone on in the thinking and quality and, uh, and certainly seems to be going on in thinking in uh, safety as well. 